to come and have this conversation with me. Um, it's a tough one. But today we are looking at that word homosexuality and how it's used in scripture. And we both have different understanding and different reflection, both how it's used as well as what we believe our Christian response um, to God's word is as we, um, as, as we live out our Christian lives. And so I just thank you for um, your willingness to join me in this conversation. And it's truly the question that's holy before uh, Midland First United Methodist Church, and that is in our theologically different understandings of Scripture, um, can we with integrity live into our Christian response, especially in regards to our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters? Um, so let's start by basking this time in prayer. Yes. Gracious and merciful God, I just ask that you will pour your Holy Spirit on um, Reverend Yum and myself that as we have um, heard your word and studied, yeah, studied the Bible, we just ask that this afternoon as we, um, we open up our hearts that you will, will guide us, you will help us speak the truth that you have um, given to us and God, for all who hear our words, may they um, hear our hearts, and may they too come to a clear understanding of how you are leading and guiding them in their Christian walk. Gracious God, thank you for being with us this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, we agree that God yeah. is calling us to love our neighbor. And our neighbor is not necessarily the person living next to us right. <laughs> or the person we agree with. And our neighbor is defined by Jesus in the story of the Good Samaritan. Yeah. And this is reflected in the words from Romans chapter 13. Sure. So before we have our conversation, let me read the scripture Thank you. for all of us. Romans 13 verses 8 through 9. Thanks. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, hmm. and any other commandments are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Today, uh, we will share the scriptures that have shaped our response uh, to our LGBTI brothers and sisters. And in doing so, we are not going to agree on what our Christian response should be. We won't fully agree, but it's continued um, to, to encourage me and give me hope with how, how much we do agree on. Mm -hmm as we study God's word and as we seek to live faithfully to that. Um, love your neighbor. Those are important words to, to hear and grow into. Mm -hmm. But as we begin today, Reverend Yum, mm -hmm. um, will you reflect on your understanding of homosexuality, um, what your understanding of scripture is and how it forms your Christian response to our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters? Thank you, Alida. I believe uh, there are at least 10 you know, Bible scriptures mm. about uh, homosexuality and marriage. Right. And most of the Bible translations, such as New International, International Version, uh, New Living Translation, New American Standard Bible, and English Version, King James Version, mm. Good News Translation, and Amplified Bible, right. uh, use the words homosexuality homosexual or homosexuals. In their translations of the Greek word arsenokoites, mm. and this word is translated in New Revised Standard Version as sodomite. Uh, uh. In Genesis 1, uh, 26 through 27, all the human beings are made mm. in the image of God, yeah. which means we have a vicarious functioning of God's reign over God's creation. Yeah. And also it says, and God made them male and female. Right. 
In Genesis 2.24, as a part of God's creation story, it says, Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. The unity and harmony of God's creation is one of the key themes in Genesis. Yeah, yeah. And Jesus confirms these verses of Genesis in his teaching of uh, marriage life in Matthew 19, uh, 4 through 5. In Leviticus uh, 18, uh, chapters 18 and 20, God teaches the Israelite uh, about the forbidden sexual practices repeatedly. Among them is homosexuality. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Before listing all the forbidden sexual practices, God says, if you obey my decrees and my regulations, you will find life through them. I'm the Lord. After Adam braiding them, God says, Do not defile yourselves mm. in any of these ways for the people I'm driving out before you have themselves in all these ways. Right. In Leviticus, one of the key words is holiness. Mm. The people of God must be holy because our God is holy. Right. And Christian holiness for their inheriting God's kingdom, as Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me read this uh, scripture for you, Thank you and for all of our church members. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Here the Greek word is Malakos, which can be translated as a caramite, or a male prostitute, mm. or a homosexual. Nor men who have sex with men. Here the Greek word is isenokoites. Uh, our NRSV uh, Bible translates this word as sodomite, as I said before. Yeah. And John Wesley believed Holiness, the Christian holiness, should be our goal of life. Yeah. But also, it should be our goal of missions. Because our holiness is a clear indication of God's kingdom come on earth. And also, it is related to God's kingdom we're going to enter uh, mm. into. So, I believe there are three grave sins in the Bible that can cause God's wrath and uh, punishment. The first one is idol worship. Mm. The second is maltreatment of the poor. The last one is sexual debauchery. Yeah. The Israelites lost their promised land because they failed in these areas. Idol worship, maltreatment of the poor, and sexual debauchery. In the same vein, Apostle Paul relates our holiness to our possession of our kingdom, of God's kingdom. Mm. The Israelites broke the unity of God's family and did not reveal God's holiness to their neighbors. Mm. <laughs> their inherited land had suffered with them for their sins, which signifies the disunity of God's covenant people, not only with their God, but also with their land. Yeah. That's why Apostle Paul says, after condemning homosexual behavior in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Yeah. He emphasizes the holiness of God's new covenant people again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, and you were bought with a price. Therefore, you must glorify God 
in your body. The biblical passages about homosexual behavior are very clear. Many scholars, whether they personally agree with Apostle Paul or not, still regard Romans 1, 26 through, through 27 as disagreeing with homosexual practices. My position on marriage and LGBTQIA issues are in line with the Book of Discipline by which I was ordained in 2010 mm. in Mission Conference. Thomas Oden, I. Howard Marshall, N. T. Wright, James Dunn, C. B. Cranfield, C. K. Barrett, Bruce Metzger, Craig Keener, Eugene Peterson are among the many scholars who have a traditional point of view about sexual How I respond to our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters hmm. is reflected in the life of Christ. And Jesus teaches us that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Also, we should love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus says, on those two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. This means all the teachings of the law and the messages of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Later in the New Testament, these two commandments become one command. Hmm. Love your neighbor. The biblical concept of neighbors stretches beyond our fellow Christians who have the same covenant of Jesus Christ. To include all people, all those in need, the whole human community, even enemies. Mm -hmm. As the disciples of Jesus, we should see every person as a neighbor and become ready to help and serve one another regardless of who the person is or the needs they have. Yeah. Personally, I have sympathy for those who have been wounded by others' insensitive and harsh treatment, sometimes in the name of Christ. Hmm. I believe one of the urgent issues that the church is facing today is how can we love our neighbors who are not like us? Hmm. What we need as Jesus' disciples who are called to love our neighbors as ourselves is humility and honesty. We must be humble because we are all forgiven sinners through the blood of Jesus Christ. We must be honest about ourselves because of the seriousness of our call to love our neighbor. Yeah. For the past almost eight years at wow. Midland First, <laughs> yes, time flies wow. so fast. Right. I've learned a lot from the people mm -hmm. on both sides, progressive and traditional. traditional. Yeah. But as their pastor, I should ask myself mm. if my efforts to love them mm. have been enough. Mm. Have they seen the love in me towards them? Mm -hmm. Frankly, I don't think I can say yes without any hesitation. Mm -hmm. It is because I fall short of loving as God commands, as God commands me to love them with the love I have through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I believe that we are living in a time that we should ask ourselves if our love is strong enough to embrace those who are not like us. Also, we needed to candidly look into our hearts if our efforts to reach out to those who are not like us have been enough to say that I have loved my neighbors as myself. Mm, that's a great question to ask and a piece of us growing on to perfection in God's grace, isn't it? Of always trying to hear God's voice and to walk into that space of, of, of loving our neighbor, of loving... Um, of loving one another more deeply and more Christ-like. 
Thank you so much, Reverend Young, for your reflection. Oh, you're welcome. I think you're that welcome. the tough part in this conversation is those places we disagree, and yet mm -hmm. um, the celebrating the graciousness and the hope is I continue to see those spots where it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, that's where God's calling us to. And I pray that we will continue to let the Holy Spirit just pour upon us, um, heal us, yeah. so that we might continue to keep elbows linked. Yeah and serve our Christ and to love mm -hmm. one another well. Mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Han, uh, as you reflect on your understanding of homosexuality, what is your understanding of scripture and how does it form your mm -hmm. Christian response to our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Reverend Yum, for the question and for this space. Mm -hmm. And today we are looking at that word homosexuality and mm -hmm. I think a piece of my understanding of that word is in scripture. Um, it's not used to just talk about two um, consenting adults who love each other, who believe that God has called them to a lifelong relationship. But in our scriptures, so often it's um, placed in places of promiscuity and permissiveness and orgies and abuse. And um, Paul in Romans 128, he says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. I just feel like here, you know, it's one more layer that Paul's adding to um, persons and, and making a statement about those who don't understand and who don't honor God versus really looking at persons who love God with all their heart and soul and are seeking to commit their lives to one other person and to journey with one other person um, for the rest of their lives and in that commitment. So I think that's just part of my struggle in general with looking at those texts about homosexuality is there's just so many other sins attached um, to that word. I look at Genesis. I look at Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over fish of the seas and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created humankind in his image. And in the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. It reminds me of those words from Psalms 139, verse 13. For it was you, and you referring to God, for it was you, O God, who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know so very well. And then if we jump back to Genesis, we remember that God everything that God made. And indeed, it was very good. And then he goes, and then there was evening and morning. And on the sixth day, that we humans were created. Being created in the image of God is just so much more than our sexual identity. It is also important to remember that God is neither male nor female, but we refer to God as he because of our biblical language that just falls short of giving pronouns to God to give God the richness and the holiness um, that our God so deserves. I also don't believe that when God created us as sexual be beings that God made mistakes. Um, and in that, that whoever God created us to be in the relationship that God created us to find that companionship of love, um, I believe is, is right. I also am reminded of Paul who shared... Um, that it's really best if all of us remain celibate because if we're celibate, then we don't have another person. Okay, these are probably more my words, but we don't have another person to worry about. We can just fully give ourselves to kingdom building and the kingdom of God. And yet, he says, you don't, don't live lives of sin. And in that, a marry and find that love and that joy that comes in our sexuality. Um, God wants us to live in a right relationship, a right relationship with our God, a right relationship with each other, and a right relationship with the one that God has created us to be with. 
Other scriptures that form my Christian response to our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters are those references that we, we've already talked mm-hmm. about of just, of just loving one another. And our call to love, um, I think, means listening intently, seeking to understand each other's story, and serving one another without judgment. John reminds us that Jesus came to this world not to condemn the world, but the, the world through him might be saved. It is as we listen to one another to understand each other's journey that we have a more full understanding of who God is and that our knowledge of who God is becomes more genuine and more complete. I think that's that story. If we each continue to just find ourselves with like-minded people, we lose the richness of who our God is. I believe it's as we love one another and love well that the Holy Spirit will be the one that will convict each of us of our sin. I am sure that, you know, there are persons who are trying to understand their sexuality and they are heterosexual or they are homosexual alike, um, for whom desires of their hearts are not the desires that God placed in them. I'm also certain that as the church loves each of us, all persons well, that the love of Christ and the Holy Spirit will convict us, okay, not only of our sexual sins, but will convict us of all of our sins. Romans 3 reminds us that as we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that it is through the redemptive love of Jesus Christ that we know God's forgiveness and God's grace. (laughs) Finally, Our journey over this last year here at Midland First, we have been studying the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We have been trying to both discern and claim those gifts that God has poured into our lives, as well as to allow the Holy Spirit to live in and through us, that those fruits of the Spirit might just ooze from us. And I see that God's Holy Spirit is that which allows us to see the life and the richness of each person that I don't think we on the outside can say, you have this gift and so you can use it and live it out where you don't have that gift. Um, But we need to look at each other and see the fruit that our lives produce and thus honor the gift that God is seeking to live in and through us. We all know that the authenticity of a life is going to be seen by the fruits we produce. And I believe that we need to honor that same spirit working in our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters. And I think we need to honor that even in the church for those who are called to be and to be ordained to lead us. We need to look at the Holy Spirit moving in their lives and not base their worthiness for proclaiming God's word on their sexual orientation question that's still in front of us is that question of how will we wholly love our neighbor? I believe that persons of the same sex are entering into a monogamous God-ordained covenant, that they should be allowed to be married in the church. God has created each of us in the image of God and deemed us good. I also believe that our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters should be allowed to use their gifts to serve God as God has given and to do. I too, along with you, although a few years earlier, was ordained and gave my promise to uphold the Book of Discipline. I guess that was back in 1991. At that time, I believe that being welcoming to our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters in our congregations was enough. I know that as I've grown and as I've learned, I think God, no, I know God is challenging me um, to break open the church that that doesn't feel like it. And so the longing of my heart and my struggle as General Conference is now postponed for another two years. And a challenge I haven't come to the end of is, am I called um, to break my covenant with the Book of Discipline? 
Or how will I continue to be able to challenge my understanding of God's word against my vow to the church Mm -hmm. with the book of discipline so that I can live my life in the faith and in my understanding of who God is with full integrity? Coming to Midland First almost three years ago, I affirmed with Reverend J.D. Landis Um, that we wanted to, and this affirmation has not changed, that we wanted to lead Midland first in the unity of Christ Jesus amidst our diversity. You know, Jesus prayed for the unity of the church, and I believe that Jesus knew just how difficult unity was going to be. He created us, you know, in his image, and God created us um, with minds to think, to ponder, to learn, and to grow. And in that, Our journeys have been different, and our understanding of who God is, is different. Jesus prayed for the church. Jesus knew how hard it would be. But I affirm today that agreement that I made with Reverend Landis two and a half years ago, almost three years ago. And I affirm with you today, Reverend Yum, our desire to lead Midland First as one body even though we have places that we don't agree, I believe, I believe we believe it's in our diversity that we get on our knees and we pray. It's in our diversity that we study God's word. And it's as we hear each other's voice and journey in each other's stories that we have a fuller understanding of who our God is. So we return to our first question. Can Midland First remain a theologically diverse group of people as we each understand our Christian response to our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters? I believe, you know, each of two, how we respond to our call to love our neighbors and keep our holiness before our God. Amen. Mm -hmm. And how we choose to share the good news and life-giving love of Jesus Christ. Can we offer forgiveness and grace to all God's children, mm-hmm. including ourselves? Mm-hmm. Also, if you can listen well to each thought and serve one another and keep us searching the scriptures together and you know, growing together, we can reveal that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ. Yeah. In the 2016 Book of Discipline, paragraph 106, The following words are shared in regards to Scripture. United Methodists share with other Christians the conviction that Scripture is the primary source of our criterion for Christian doctrine. Through Scripture, the living Christ meets us in the experience of redeeming grace. We are convinced that Jesus Christ is the living Word of God in our midst, whom we trust in life and death. Reverend Yum, thank you so much for entering into this time of conversation and learning and growing together. And just thank you for your faithful study and care to uphold God's word. Thank you so much, Reverend Ha, thank for you. preparing for this kind of a time together with me. And in the process of our conversation, thank you in mm-hmm. many ways. Amen. And I hope you know God continually lead our church uh, to be faithful in you know, God's kingdom, you know, people. So, uh, can you. I close? That would be great if you would close this in prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for this time that we can share our thoughts on homosexuality candidly, mm. uh, based on our understanding of the Scripture. God, we that. We can be holy before you continually. God, help us to be deepened in our understanding about your love. God, allow us to have the spirit of humility Mm -hmm. and honesty. God, we want to grow together so that people around us can see your kingdom is here with us, Lord. And we pray this in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.